Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure being here, and I want to thank uh, Lurk for inviting me, uh, and I want to thank you all for joining me. The title, Race and Labor, A More Just Economy. So that seemed pretty straightforward to me until I started to try to write the speech. And then I realized immediately that there was a problem. And the problem is that depending on how you uh, look at grammar, the implication of the statement of the second clause is that at some point there was a sort of just economy. In other words, if you have a more just economy, it's more in comparison to what, right? As opposed to we're for a just economy. And uh, this triggered some thoughts that I had, which takes me to what I love to discuss, which is history. You see, there's an assumption in many circles that capitalism could have developed in the absence of race and racist oppression. Uh, and uh, by analogy, think of this as uh, a, uh, a sculptor who's working with a piece of clay, and they're molding this into some pottery, and at some point they decide, well, maybe what I'll do is add something to it, like a handle or something, something that's not essential, but something that might make it look a little bit better. There are those that believe that capitalism is essentially the same thing, that there's this pure economic system that's self-contained to which have been added things like racist oppression or male supremacy, but that it could otherwise stand on its own. So this gives hope to liberals and conservatives alike that if we can simply reform away some of the worst aspects of racism and sexism, we'll have a rational economic system within which we can all feel free to play. So I'm going to challenge that by stating that capitalism and what we came to be known as the United States and started as the 13 British colonies was founded not on anything having to do with justice, but was founded on forced labor. In that important sense, it did not start on the basis of freedom or any sense that the economy should be just. To the extent to which there was any sense of just, it was largely contained in the settler myth of freedom, and specifically the freedom to obtain land, land that was allegedly not being utilized by anyone. This freedom could permit a man and his family, and I phrase this quite consciously, the opportunity to grow and prosper. Prosperity was never guaranteed, of course, but there was a chance. So let's unpack this. Capitalism needed forced labor in order to kickstart. Myth leads us to believe that European settlers came to these shores largely as religious refugees and happily went about the work of building a new country. Well, it didn't quite happen that way. Those who originally came, who represented the elite, needed a workforce. The Spanish and the Portuguese and the Caribbean and what we now know as Latin America first went about enslaving the indigenous. When that proved insufficient for the purposes of raping the land, they then brought over Africans. English, for a variety of reasons, were interested in settling a population. The Spanish and the Portuguese had not sent massive numbers of immigrants or uh, colonists. The English, uh, the English, on the other hand, sent massive population. And that had to do with the way that capitalism was developing in, in, uh, in England. But this population that was sent here was very restive. It was the dispossessed. It was the former farmer. It was the pauper. It was the prisoner. And to a great extent, they were compelled to come to these shores. In the case of Ireland, there was little question. As a result of English colonialism, Irish were transported in mass to the New World to serve as forced labor, not as slaves. European forced labor suffered under horrendous conditions slave-like. But even then, there was a need for even greater amounts of labor. And just like the Spanish and Portuguese, the English turned to Africa. Africa presented a special opportunity. Europeans began seeking forced labor from Africa at almost exactly the same time that the last great West African empire, the Sungai, was collapsing. With no major power in central West Africa, standing firm against this invasion, Europeans were able to obtain labor by playing one tribe or ethnic group against another. 
Yet, and this is critical for our story, those who were forced to these shores were largely indentured servants rather than slaves, which is something that many of us did not realize for a very long time. We thought that Africans came over here from the very beginning as slaves, and it turned out that most Africans in the 1600s came here as indentured servants, not as slaves. That did not mean that Africans went down to the shores of Senegal to book passage to New York. It meant that they were kidnapped, much like the Irish were kidnapped, and were brought over to North America, but they came as indentured servants. Um, it was only later in the 1600s, as Theodore Allen points out in his two-volume work, The Invention of the White Race, that the ruling elite in the 13 colonies moved in the direction of the introduction of racial slavery for life, which of course assumed the creation not only of blacks, but more importantly, the creation of whites. There were no white people on this planet before 1492. This choice by the elite was not accidental. It was in response to the problem of control over labor. The systems of race and racist oppression were created in order to enforce control over two populations, a system derived from what was introduced by the English in the colonization of Ireland actually control over three populations. So in that sense, race should be understood as the materialization of a differential in treatment between populations for the benefit of the elite. This differential in treatment was dramatically illustrated through the construction of racial slavery for life, chattel slavery, which was imposed upon African populations, and, of course, the genocide committed against the indigenous. And no analysis of U.S. capitalism, therefore, can be taken seriously in the absence of understanding the settler component vis-a-vis -vis the indigenous population. While the oppression of the African and African descendant population has been a stumbling block for what came to be known as organized labor, the indigenous question has been all but overlooked entirely. Free land, as it were, proved to be a major slogan of the expanding U.S. It had a double meaning in that there would not be slavery, and that the land would be available for the settler. But the land was never free of inhabitants, though the spread of diseases, largely brought initially by the Spanish and Portuguese, which wiped out by some estimates close to 80% of the indigenous population in the Western Hemisphere in 100 years, this spreading of disease reduced the indigenous population, but indigenous people remained here. In either case, no one can make a serious argument that the land was vacant. The opening of the West was an escape valve for the pressures of developing capitalism in the eastern part of the United States. It served as both a reality and a myth. As opposed to a future of class struggle, the European worker was provided with altern the alternative course of moving West, or at a minimum, believing that moving West and moving out of the working class was a viable option. The European and later Euro-American worker was faced with a choice. While admittedly brought over to North America in horrendous conditions, or later coming voluntarily to North America in search of a better life, they were immediately confronted with a choice that they could not avoid making. To exist in what came to be known as the U.S., one had to not only enter the racial hierarchy, but in some cases fight for a distinct place in that hierarchy, even if that meant stomping on others. The alternative was, the, uh, was represented, however, by John Brown and those that would be def described as white who decided to actively oppose the racial hierarchy. As David Rodiger has pointed out, the appeal of whiteness for many European immigrants by the 19th century is that it removed the stain of ethnic and national oppression from European populations, a stain that was painted on their backs while in Europe. An Irish person, for instance, treated as nothing more than a dog by the English and in fact designated by the English as an inferior race. The term, by the way, is not mine. It is exactly what the English said, that the Irish were an inferior race. Uh, thereby raising a very interesting question for many of us, that race was not seen, at least initially, as necessarily being about color. But an Irish person could come here as having been treated as an inferior race in, in Ireland and, and in England. 
they find themselves in the United States positioned such that they could ultimately and very selectively identify with parts of their ethnic background and at the same time identify as part of this larger thing called the white mass. It was absolutely brilliant. Come to the U.S. as Irish and over the course of one generation become white. All Europeans have faced the same challenge in coming to our shores. I was told a story by someone of Sicilian origin uh, last year that his ancestors had come to the United States, went to Ellis Island, and had on their immigration certificate stamped as their race, dark. Now think about that for a moment, dark, for a European. Thus, a people were immediately treated as racially suspicious, and thus they would have to prove themselves to be white. There was no automatic get past here free card. One had to prove oneself to be white. In order to be accepted into the white bloc, one was expected to both acknowledge the status quo, but to also participate in the furtherance of racist oppression. This is where the system of social control worked so remarkably well, and more importantly, did not depend on specific commands and controls by the elite. It was like a learning algorithm. In the early stages of the development of capitalism in the colonies and later in the New Republic, proving oneself to be white necessitated taking a stand on both the question of slavery and the question of the indigenous. Over the course of time, this expanded to taking a stand on the question of the Mexican and Chicano and the Asian. But in the beginning, it was simple, and to a great extent, the choice was related to military and quasi-military activity. The European, as a price for not being a slave, was expected to have a weapon and to serve on slave patrols and colonial, later state militias. These armed units were essential in preventing slave uprisings and indigenous incursions. But they were also successful in ensuring the submission of the Euro-American poor or the white poor. The white poor were treated, or excuse me, the white poor were trusted with weapons, weapons that slaves could not possess, weapons that the indigenous could only possess at great risk. Ambiguity in the face of the demand to participate in racist oppression led to ridicule, such as the notion of a nigger lover. It also led to people dying, as was seen in the terror that was perpetrated at the end of the Reconstruction period in the 1800s, when terror was meted out against those whites who sided with the poor and with the black. The creation of the white bloc was therefore essential for the development of US capitalism. It ensured a particular and peculiar form of stability that the system needed. And it transcended the question of available land as a central reference point. For after the land had been conquered, and the Native American either eliminated, imprisoned, or placed on reservations, the illusion of freedom to grow did not disappear, but was transformed into the freedom to grow relative to racialized populations, and most especially the indigenous, the African descendant, Mexican, Chicano, and Asians. And to put it in a different way, whites were offered a deal, and the deal was very simple. You may be poor, but you'll never be a nigger. You may be poor, but you'll never be a spick. You may be poor, you'll never be a chink. That your situation will always be cushioned by racialized populations. And I want you to keep that in mind because it's very relevant to the rise of right-wing populism, which we'll talk about uh, later if we have some time. The particular construction of U.S. capitalism presented a problem for what came to be known as organized labor. Without ad addressing the matter of race, organized labor could explain neither how the system worked nor the chief inhibitor to the growth of power for the working class. Let me put it in a different way. If you want to better understand how any poor white person could conceivably believe that they have something in common with the Koch brothers, individuals who hold poor whites in utter contempt, you're forced to conclude one of two things, either the significance of race or that whites are insane. I tend to think it has something to do with race. Karl Marx put it best and very concisely when he said, labor in the white skin can never free itself as long as labor in the black skin is branded. 
If you broaden the understanding of black skin to mean racialized populations, this statement has profound implications. Organized labor contained within its ranks those fighting for what they envisioned to be economic justice, but they saw it in racial terms. They could even be amazingly radical in their rhetoric, yet simultaneously openly white supremacists. Case in point, Andrew Furuset. F-U-R-U-S-E-T-H, the president of the International Siemens Union excuse me, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And if you look at the works of, of this man, what you find that's remarkable is some of his speeches and statements seem like he was absolutely on the left. And then in the next paragraph, he's denouncing the Chinese and talking about the yellow peril. His conception of trade unionism was as a white project within a white republic. This contradictory stand was not simply a matter of perceiving people of color as inferior, but more importantly, seeing them as irrelevant and not part of the white republic that they believed that they were building and supporting. Insofar as organized labor in the United States never took a stand on the matter of settlerism, including but not limited to the aggression against the indig indigenous, it was not capable of becoming a fully transformational movement. These inconsistencies haunt organized labor till this day. It is also worth noting that the, uh, this question of a white republic, race, relevant populations, not only haunted organized labor, but served as the major foundation for the political cancer of our time, the movement of right-wing populism. Right-wing populism, the irrationalist, nationalist, aggressive political movement that exists as the herpes of capitalism is in the United States grounded in the settler myth, leading it to racism, xenophobia, as well as founded upon myths of the past, including those related to male supremacy and patriarchy. This movement, which can be seen today in a Tea Party and the candidacy that brought us Donald Trump, is one that much of organized labor found difficult to challenge, in part because right-wing populism poses as an economic justice movement for the disenfranchised against the elite. Right-wing populism can emulate the language of progressives, including of the trade union movement, but emulate more in the manner that a funhouse mirror distorts reality. Right-wing populism positions itself to be the voice of what it portrays as a disenfranchised white person, the white person allegedly threatened by the wealthy elite on the one hand and the barbarian and usually brown and black masses beneath. It suggests that it and it alone can bring about a just economy, but such an economy is only for the relevant population and in reality, as we can see in the aftermath of the Republican tax bill for the upper most echelon of this country. Thus, for a labor movement in the United States to advance the cause of a just economy, it can never position itself as simply fighting on narrow economic terms. This may sound contradictory, but once one appreciates that the economic system in which we find ourselves did not develop in the absence of a social political construction of race, one can better appreciate that economic justice does not emerge absent challenging the system of racist oppression. This point is missed on many progressive movements, most especially progressive populist movements, including the iconic populist party of the 1890s, but also most recently the left populism of the Bernie Sanders campaign of 2016. Race was essential for the success of capitalism, both in terms of getting it off the ground, but also sustaining it. And it has sustained capitalism by providing a section of the working class, the white section, a rationale for collaborating with the elite, an elite who, and quite ironically, hold the white worker at arm's length, the people that they call the white trash. Therefore, we must ask, in the words of an old book, what is to be done? In our book, Solidarity Divided, Dr. Fernando Gapacin, who honors me by being here, and I attempted to offer a context for understanding the current state of the trade union movement, but also our suggestions as to what needs to be done. There are two points I'd like to emphasize here. First, the question of a different form of labor unionism. Second, the need to think at the strategic level in majoritarian terms. The criticisms that are frequently offered of contemporary trade unionism focus primarily on its approach towards collective bargaining, 
perhaps an organizing strategy, and occasionally the absence of internationalism in its practice. All of these are of critical importance, and nothing here aims to minimize such critiques. Yet my argument is that we have to go further and deeper. When Gapasin and I speak of the need for what we call social justice unionism, we're neither restricting ourselves to the necessity for membership mobilizations, nor speaking only of the necessity for alliances, which are all of critical importance. We're suggesting that the aims of trade unionism must be transformative. That is, they must be articulating an alternative to the madness that is contemporary capitalism. Such an approach is not to be contained in the speeches of leaders alone, but in a reconceptualization of the actual goals of trade unionism, what we would call labor unionism. It must be a unionism that aims quite consciously to unite the working class against neoliberal capitalism. In order to succeed in this task, it must become a movement that no longer envisions itself as a special interest, but as a movement of a class, in fact, a badly divided class, and a movement that has transnational objectives. Social justice unionism is a unionism of those protected and unprotected by labor law. It is the unionism of those who have lost their jobs because of capital flight. It is the unionism of the South and the Southwest where white supremacy has successfully combined with employer repression in order to suppress workers' rights and full democracy. It is a unionism that calls into question the way that things are produced, and particularly in this era of environmental catastrophe, asks the question, what sort of economy continues to produce in such a way that it threatens the existence of humanity? Social justice unionism necessitates organizing workers as a social movement that can tackle such questions. Of course, it must organize and always fight around reforms in the workplace and in industries, but it must provide a compelling vision, a vision that I would argue is lacking. Organized labor all too often appears to be the old defeated fighter struggling desperately to stay on its feet in the boxing ring, repeatedly pounded by its opponents. Rather than positioning itself to be David, who circling Goliath is carefully and methodically ascertaining how it will take down its opponent. To wage the fight for a just economy, we must also engage in majoritarian thinking and a majoritarian strategy. This takes us back to the matter of right-wing populism, our chief opponent. It is always worth reminding ourselves that the working class is not restricted to white men in hard hats and work shirts. It is not restricted to white women in offices, medical facilities, or factories. The working class of the United States is multi-ethnic. It includes those who are understood to be African American, white, Asian, Latinos, Native Americans, those who are immigrants and those who are not. Indeed, the entire population is becoming increasingly diverse, a fact that scares much of white America and horrifies right-wing populace. The progressive movement for the 21st century a movement that must advance the fight for a just economy, must be a movement that represents the new majority. It must be the movement that does not pine after the so-called sincere Trump voter or what was understood in the 1980s to be the so-called Reagan Democrat. The so-called sincere Trump voters, those who may not be racist, sexist, misogynist, xenophobic, or irrational, will be won over in time, hopefully. But they will be won over based on the strength and vision of a progressive movement that provides a compelling alternative to this economy that we live in, and in fact for a different society. Ours must be a movement that responds to despair with hope and answers. Those answers may not be easy, nor will they necessarily be comfortable. The crises we are facing are not simple, and we are standing where we are because of a history of forced labor, slavery, genocide, annexation, murder of workers, and the resistance against all of these. This means that addressing race and labor and fighting for a just economy must take place both nationally and in each state. We must build majoritarian coalitions and political organizations that are fighting for power. The current configuration of organized labor, along with newer forms of worker organizations, must be part of this effort, but they cannot do it alone. To reverse trends that did not start on November 8, 2016, but go back much further, a majoritarian must, movement must seize power and it must protect such victories. It must do so with a vitality and urgency that is grounded in an understanding that we're attempting to both right the wrongs of history as well as save humanity from a very real dystopia. And it's here that we'll stop so that we can engage in a dialogue 
and hopefully bring about the sort of unity and understanding that we so desperately need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm interested to hear what thoughts you might have about how organized labor might proceed in terms of addressing settler colonization. I think that's enough questions for today. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that they're serving breakfast, so we should have an answer by then. As an activist in the anti-war community for many years, I've come to the conclusion that the uh, system in New York and Washington, D.C. is not going to change and isn't capable of changing its practices of war around the world because that's inherent and intrinsic in the structure of the system of New York and Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm curious if you share that, uh, that observation in the uh, race and labor area. Okay. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas about how to address um, the reluctance of um, many white people to even talk about racism and their reluctance to admit that they are part of the problem just as people of color are part of the problem. And you see what I mean? It's, it's a, yeah. There's a new fancy word called white fragility. I think that's what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not going to take them in order. Uh, the question about whether there actually uh, can be dramatic changes that the gentleman was raising. Uh, I, I'm a Marxist, and I um, believe and have believed for most of my life that capitalism is antithetical to the future of humanity. And um, so that doesn't mean that there aren't reforms that can't be won, and very important reforms, including on the environment and healthcare, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we have to keep in mind that capitalism is the first amoral economic system that emerged in humanity. Other systems had a different way of operating, a different set of philosophies. The thing that's unique about capitalism is that the nature of the way it operates um, takes hold and brings over to the dark side of the force people irrespective of their goodness because it operates in a certain way. It's compelled through the drive for profits. Uh, it's, it's compelled through uh, the way that the market operates. It's compelled to rape countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo in order to get valuable minerals so that we can have cell phones. Um, that's the way the system operates. And it's destroying the planet. So in a fundamental sense, no, I don't think that capitalism can resolve this. But I do think that there's plenty of things that we can and should be doing right now. Uh, in order to uh, improve people's lives, which is why I think voting is, remains very, very important. Even if you have candidates that are not perfect or don't necessarily line up with your fundamental views, there are very real things that are happening in the political arena we've got to pay attention to. And we can't sit back and say, it doesn't matter, a plague on all the houses. Um, So this question of what the gentleman said about this term right, white fragility, it's a term I don't use. Um, but let me describe how I've experienced it. I've experienced it when you're having a discussion about race and a white person says, I feel attacked. And you as a person of color is standing there saying, I, I don't understand how you would come to that conclusion. I wasn't talking about you, your family, or necessarily anything that you did, yet you're saying you're attacked. And, and I was in the middle of a training and all of a sudden, it was like lightning struck me and I got it. You see, there, there is 
there is a problem of awareness. And when that problem, or when awareness is revealed, and I know this sounds like I'm going down a religious direction, but when the awareness is revealed, there's a certain awareness of the racially oppressed. And most of us, unless we're living on top of a mountain that we're racially oppressed, learn very early about the dynamics of racist oppression. We learn different things about how we had to survive, things that you couldn't do, people you couldn't talk back to, things like that. But there's an awareness that whites have when exposed to the dynamics of racist oppression, they start realizing that they've been treated like chumps for 500 years. And it's, it's an awareness that gets people really angry. I mean, it's like when you realize that you've been treated like a chump by the rich, that you've been played as a sucker by the rich, that you haven't gained from this system, you've been manipulated, a lot of people get very angry. And that anger often gets focused in the wrong way. It gets focused on, I'm feeling attacked. No, it's not that you're feeling attacked. It's like you're now feeling like a sucker, and you're trying to figure out, what the hell do I do about it? And, and so that's part of the challenge that we have when we're talking about race. I mentioned before the issue of John Brown. John Brown is one of the most interesting historical characters in the United States because U.S. history can't decide what to think about John Brown. If you ever watch any documentaries or attempts at documentaries, they really can't figure out. Here you got this white man who organized these other white people to organize with African slaves to create an insurrection, first in Kansas, and then he was trying to build a guerrilla war with the Harpers Ferry Raid, and this, this simply doesn't make any sense according to the narrative of U.S. history. But this was someone who made a decision. He made a decision against the idea of the racial hierarchy. And he obviously paid a price. But there is an alternative direction. There are trade unionists who, like the industrial workers of the world, they followed a different course when it came to race. And they paid a certain price, but they stood by their beliefs. So the, kind, so the idea of an anti-racist practice, which is not about making whites feel guilty, I don't give a damn whether you like me, I don't want you to feel guilty, because guilt immobilizes people. Guilt is a very unreliable emotion, because you become guilty today and vindictive tomorrow. I want you to be a, 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 a engaged in solidarity. That's what John Brown understood. That's what the Wobblies understood. So the discussion that we have to have is not mainly about, you taste my food, I taste yours, we sing kumbaya and we cry and hug, right? It's not mainly about, um, wow, you use this term, and I don't like this term, right? It's about who is engaged in the freedom struggle. And for me, it may be reductionist, that's what I'm concerned about. Because there are people I used to work with in the shipyard, when I first uh, got into the labor movement, who were very inconsistent on matters of race. But when, I'd, when I would see them engaged in struggle, I thought, okay, there is a possibility of change, right? Through a combination of them engaging in struggle and them uh, uh, being exposed to alternative ideas, people can, in fact, change. That's the direction that we need to be going. Unfortunately, there's too much of this, you know, feel good, Let's cry, let's get to know each other more stuff, sometimes called diversity trainings, when what we need to be doing is anti-racist education and promoting an anti-racist practice, which leads to the question about organized labor and, and settler colonialism. Um, are there any other questions? <laughs> Just, um, you know, the thing about this in all seriousness, the answer begins with a willingness on the part of organized labor to engage in a discussion. Um, you can't turn back the clock. We can't go back to 1607 and wipe out the Jamestown colony. 
uh, and fly you know, in to, to help the indigenous defeat the invasion. That ain't going to happen. Um, but there are things that, that can happen beginning with a certain kind of internal education uh, about the history of this country. And this is, again, where a lot of people become very uncomfortable. It's one of the reasons that the state, the, the right wing in Arizona, does not want a discussion of the Mexican-American War. Because if you have a discussion about the Mexican-American War, the first thing you realize is that it was a war of aggression, of naked aggression by the United States against Mexico. And that's not just me speaking, that's Abraham Lincoln speaking, who, who spoke out against the, against the war. That the whole of northern Mexico was seized by the United States on a pretext. Um, and, and that ever since then, the lands that have been occupied by people of Mexican descent and of the indigenous have been steadily eroding and been grabbed by settlers. So the, one of the questions for organized labor is, what stand do we take on this? What stand do we take on land rights? Uh, what stand do we take on um, reservations? Uh, you know, what stand do we take on pipelines that go through indigenous communities? Do we basically just say, hey, I need a job, so to hell with your treat, uh, treaty rights? Or do we say, well, uh, we're going to have to respect because these are actually independent nations. Um, when, when do we have a discussion about the fact that the United States in the period from 1783 to, I believe, 1880, had more than 300 treaties with native peoples and broke every one of them. Every one of the treaties. So the next time you hear one of these commentators on Fox talk about country X that violates treaties, one of the things to ask them is, well, what do we make of the United States breaking more than 300 treaties? And let's see where the, you know, how long the stammering lasts. You see, we, we, that's the discussion that has to happen within organized labor. But the leaders of organized labor, by and large, are cowardly. And they are afraid that if you have this discussion, that white people are going to run away screaming. They're going to sort of lose their minds and just run away and never want to have anything to do with unions. I actually have more confidence in white people, believe it or not. And, and I, as I said before, I don't think most white people are insane. And I also don't think most white people are going to run away screaming. You have a discussion. You treat people like adults. Let's have the discussion and aim to win people over. And I think that that's the beginning. And then, you know, the, it's building the practice of solidarity, recognizing the history, and then finally repairing the damage. And with the indigenous... Uh, there's a whole lot of damage that needs to be repaired. A whole lot of damage. Oh, um, hi. Um, I'm I'm very pleased to have a chance to meet you and attend this this talk. I read read this informative book of yours uh, several years ago, Solidarity Divided, and thank you for signing my heavily underlined book. Thank you. Um, but I've been following you for a long time. You were on the uh, uh, on, on honorary, honorary advisory board of the Palestinian Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Yeah. You've testified in front of the UN, uh, the General Assembly, in support of Palestine. And, um, got that? <laughs> <laughs> and my question to you is, is uh, what made you, with your background in labor and issues of labor, uh, become a Palestinian solidarity activist? And can you help us maybe make some of those connections also? Thank you. Let, be, let, let me respond to that, uh, Sherman, before we... Okay. Because um, the answer is complicated. Uh, it begins when I was 14 years old. Um, and I was in my freshman year at high school, and my social studies, uh, this was two years after the Six-Day War. Um, so you have an idea how old I am. Uh, and um, it was two years after the Six-Day War. And my, my teacher in social studies wanted to have a debate on what was at that point called the Arab-Israeli crisis. 
So she set up two teams, and I was put in charge of the Arab team. And, um, and so I went down to the offices of the Palestine Liberation Organization in New York, and, uh, and I got a lot of material, and I did a lot of research, and we had the debate. And we kicked the ass of the Israeli side. And we did it, and it was so much fun, because it was so funny. We, we devastated them so much so that my teacher, who was a, very much of a Zionist, a great teacher, but she was a Zionist, we disagreed immensely. She was supposed to be moderating. She jumped in to come after my team, at which point the class erupted and said, Mrs. Schwartz, you're supposed to be neutral, <laughs> right? And at that point, everybody admitted we had won. Um, I learned so much from that. And I learned about uh, the, the settler colonialism uh, in a different way. Um, I, uh, and I saw the, the incredible parallels between what the Palestinians faced and what African Americans faced, what particularly Native Americans faced. Uh, and I became engaged in this. And, um, and I've paid a price for it because many of us that speak up in favor of Palestinian rights are called anti-Semites. Um, but that's very hard for people to come after me since I'm always arguing against anti-Semitism and particularly about the way that right-wing populism uses anti-Semitism. Uh, but you nevertheless pay a, pay a certain price. The problem in organized labor is that again, we don't want to really have the discussion about, the, about Palestinians. But it goes back to the founding of Israel in the sense that in the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust, and particularly the, the reality that the West, including the United States, permitted the Nazis to annihilate Jews, closed off its borders to Jews, turned away boats that contained Jews. After World War II, there was a, um, a kind of rethinking about policy. And it was agreed by a section, a section of the US ruling elite, as well as sections of the uh, English that uh, the state of Israel would be allowed to be formed, despite the fact that there was an Arab population living there. The Arab population was never asked, what do you think about this? Uh, there was no vote. And I thought that that was fundamentally wrong and continued to. And so I think it's been really important that we have these discussions. And, uh, and every time there's an attempt to shut these discussions down, I know that I'm standing on the right side of history, right? Because what's the fear? I, I know every time I hear that the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, that there's some legislator that's trying to render it illegal, I know I'm on the right side of history. Because why would you render illegal a nonviolent form of protest, right? It, it, it's obviously because there's something that is scaring the bejeebies out of you. So um, unfortunately, in most of organized labor, we can't have that discussion. There's a great deal of fear. And I'm, I keep hoping that that will change. Uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity of going on a labor delegation to the uh, occupied Palestinian territories. And this will be my final comment. Um, going through the occupied territories reminded me of driving through Navajo country. in the Southwest, uh, the same level of depression, um, same level of lack of control of one's land. And I also realized that, the, that the, the notion of an occupation doesn't really convey what's going on. What's going on is a slow moving annexation, and which will be accomplished quite soon, it looks like. So um, that was probably more than you wanted to know. 
and may have upset some of you. I'm sorry, but I have a plane to catch tomorrow, so I have to be real. These are great questions. Um, how much time do we have? Yeah, six o'clock. Okay. All right. Um, you want to take one more question and then answer? No, let me start with these. These are, these are pretty meaty. Um, not that the others weren't. Um, okay, so let me start with the question that you were raising that was actually multiple questions. Um, organized labor in the United States overall has never quite understood international solidarity. There are certain unions that have been much better than others. The International Longshore and Warehouse Union, for example, has been much better. Um, but in part because we had an, a labor movement that was developing in the context of an empire, there was a certain view of its relationship to the rest of the world that was distorted. We're the only country that has unions that call themselves internationals. And that's because these unions started in the United States and moved into Canada. Um, some tried to move into, uh, into Puerto Rico later after the Spanish-American War. And after the Spanish-American War, there was also an ironic attempt to move into Cuba. Um, but those unions stopped organizing in Cuba for one of the funniest reasons one could imagine. And that's because they couldn't figure out who was black and who was white. And they just said, to hell with it. We're giving up. Um, and that's a true story. Um, so we, we have unions in the United States that have frequently seen their role in international affairs to be the champions of US foreign policy. And that's included working hand in hand with the CIA. So after World War II, uh, the uh, AFL, the American Federation of Labor, this is before the merger, was very active in different parts of the world in trying to suppress left-led union formations, uh, including in Japan, which had a very strong left-led labor movement uh, that was basically crushed. There was an alliance essentially between the CIA and the Yakuza to destroy it. Um, the, uh, when the AFL and the CIO merge, they continue a policy of almost unconditional support for US foreign policy. And so that included helping in coups. 1964 in British Guiana, now, now the country of Guyana, overthrowing Chetty Jagan. 1973, September 11th, the overthrow of Salvador Allende in Chile. And, and so the view of, of internationalism was completely distorted. Now, yes, there were efforts. There were groups like um, uh, federations like the Wobblies, the Industrial Workers of the World, some of the CIO unions that attempted other practices. But the dominant practice was one that supported US foreign policy. OK, so over time, and particularly after the mid-1970s, when capitalism starts going through this real global reorganization, the, you started to see a proliferation of runaway shops. That's what we call them at the time. Uh, plant closings that were, that were taking place. And there was a certain reality that then becomes mythologized, which was we're losing our jobs because of foreigners. Now, the, um, and so the idea and the assumption was that um, people, that these plants were closing and moving overseas. That was only partially true, and it was true for certain sectors. So the textile and garment industry, which had largely been in the northeast part of the United States, moves first to the US South, cuts a deal with government and with white workers to basically be mainly non-union, then abandons the South and goes into the Caribbean, Latin America, and then eventually starts moving to Asia. So, it's true that they did. But most of what was going on was something very different 
and something that organized labor basically wasn't talking about, which was the introduction of new technologies, the closing of plants for financial reasons because of all kinds of capital reorganizations, and the, um, the shrinking of workforces. So the United States produces more, it manufactures more than it did 40 years ago, but it does so with fewer people. So when, every time I hear someone say, we got a service economy, I want to start just screaming because it's as if we're not manufacturing anything here. And that's completely wrong. There's a lot of manufacturing going on, but the role, but where it's happening and who's involved has changed. So where you had once upon a time RCA that was founded uh, largely through uh, federal government assistance in Camden, New Jersey, eventually moves out of Camden, abandons Camden, moves to Indiana, moves into uh, either Tennessee or Kentucky, and then moves out of the country. Um, you have uh, other uh, 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 areas where there was major manufacturing, Youngstown, Ohio. Flint, Michigan, you can just name them, East St. Louis. Plants close down, and industry ends up getting relocated, not necessarily overseas, but frequently into rural areas. And there was a study that was done when I was at the AFL-CIO that showed something remarkable about the state of Wisconsin, which was the number of manufacturing jobs that were lost in 10 years and were gained in 10 years. It matched. But it turned out that the jobs that were lost were lost in Milwaukee and Kenosha. The jobs that were gained were gained in the woods. So industry moved into traditionally white areas and non-union areas. Organized labor wasn't really talking about this. In, instead, there was this obsession with trade agreements. Now, the trade agreements are in, in many ways obviously a problem. NAFTA has been disastrous. But most trade unionists, when they're talking about NAFTA, they're not talking about the impact that NAFTA had on Canada, right? and the jobs that were lost in Ontario. They're not talking about the impact on Mexico. Very few people are talking about the impact that NAFTA had on the Mexican public sector, and the contributing role of that to Mexican migration to the United States. You know, the, so the discussions end up becoming very narrow and very Charlie Brownish. You know, there was a song in the 60s where the singer, it, I think it was called Charlie Brown, and at some point he says, why is everybody always picking on me? And that's the way we act. As, and this is what plays into Trump, who repeatedly says, everybody is picking on us, as if the United States is a simple victim of all of these vultures that are swarming down and just eating pieces of us and flying off, right? When it's a little bit different, I'd say it's like more like the reverse. Um, so, so, but we, by the way that organized labor talked about this, it in fact laid the foundation for Trump. Because when we were just talking about trade agreements, and we were, we were talking about the Democrats don't get it, the Republicans don't get it, then all of a sudden, this guy with orange hair shows up, and he starts talking about trade agreements. And then some of our members say, hey, I'm going with that. That's exactly what you guys have been saying. Well, if that's exactly what we've been saying, we're in deep trouble. And it's because our analysis of capitalism has been so limited. You, you don't have a broader discussion about the changes in technology. Let, let me give you an example of something. Uh, Fernando mentioned Nancy McLean. She wrote an earlier book, and in that book, uh, one of the things that she was talking about was that in the late 1950s, early 60s, there was a jobs crisis facing black America, actually African Americans and Puerto Ricans. And the job crisis was a, as a result of automation and, uh, and suburbanization. The bulk of organized labor paid no attention to this. A group called the Negro American Labor Council, led by A. Philip Randolph, did pay attention to it. And they said, in October 1963, we need to have a national march on Washington to protest and raise the question of jobs. 
Martin Luther King found out about that march, and they engaged in discussions, and that's where the August 1963 famous march came about as a result. We're talking about the early 60s, that people were recognizing something was changing in capitalism, and it was affecting the working class, but it was affecting a part of the working class that most of the leadership of organized labor wasn't particularly concerned with. But by the 1970s, when that cancer had spread to other parts of the country, then it became a national crisis. We weren't raising these issues. The same can be said about immigration, that for much of the time within organized labor, and I don't mean just recently, there has been an opposition to uh, immigration from the global south. And we're not talking about immigration from Ireland. I have not heard of any recent protests against immigrants coming from Ireland. There's no ICE raids I can remember against any Russian communities in Brooklyn. Um, no Ukrainians that I know have been picked up recently. There's no Russian planes that have been shot down bringing people here. Um, when we're talking about immigration these days, we're talking about immigration from the global south. And much of organized labor, up until uh, about 20 years ago, a little less than that, was very focused on immigrants are taking our jobs. Again, lays the foundation for the right-wing populism that we see in uh, Trump. And one of the questions I've asked people repeatedly, I've, gone, I've done this survey around the country, and I'm going to do it here. I want you to think hard on this question. How many of you know of any factories, any shipyards or hospitals that have been shut down by undocumented immigrants? Just raise your hand. I mean, don't be shy about this now. Right? So if they're not being shut down by undocumented immigrants, they're being shut down by someone else, why the hell aren't we focusing on someone else? Why is it that we're focusing on the, on the undocumented immigrants? Right? And, and these are the issues that, unfortunately, much of our movement is not talking about. Um, the, the question uh, that was raised about the... Um, well, no, I'm going to save that. The issue of identity politics. So unfortunately, this is a term that is used in different ways. And I, I don't use the term because, because depending on who you're talking to, they may not get the right interpretation. But identity politics has in some quarters been used as a term to refer to a politics that either is anti-racist, anti-sexist, et cetera, or a politics that is uh, privileging your own identity as opposed to so-called other identities. And so what happens is, depending on what your objective is, when you use that term, people can sometimes get really baffled. So my, my approach is this. As you, you heard from my speech, I think that anti-racist, and even though I didn't speak much about it, but anti-sexist politics have to be central to anything that's progressive. But it's part of an overall narrative that we need to be creating about the kind of society that we're building. It's not about how I see myself. It's about oppressions. And it's about the way that those oppressions and not how I see myself, not what I think I see when I look in the mirror in the morning, right? but how those oppressions interact. So the term intersectionality was mentioned, which is a term that really is talking about the way that various oppressions come together, and that no one is linear, no one is one-dimensional, that there are different oppressions, in fact, that affect all of us. So you're, you're, you may be an African-American man, but you know, what is the role of class in your reality? What is your relationship to male supremacy, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I would say that those that attack identity politics in the name of glorifying a so-called pure class politics don't understand US history and don't understand the way that capitalism is constructed. 
uh, those that uphold identity politics as a way of saying uh, that because I am black and you're not, you'll never understand me, are those that basically believe that only whales can critique Moby Dick. And that is, in fact, a disaster. There are universal principles. There are things that people can learn. Um, now to the last point that was raised. The political right is not monolithic. There are different tendencies. And for a number of years, uh, sometimes when we think about the right, the political right, we're thinking about conservatives. Uh, traditional, they want to preserve sort of things. They don't want too much change to take place. There are segments of the right wing that I would not describe as conservative at all. They're really quite radical, but not radical in a progressive way, radical in a way that they want to eliminate uh, the institutions of, of society, current society, eliminate democracy, and institute a raw form of capitalism that has some feudalistic uh, characteristics. It's very radical, and, and, and so it's something that you could see in Nazism. Nazism was not, uh, the conservatives in, in Germany were not very excited about Nazism because they saw radical change that the Nazis were proposing to bring about, radical change that would unseat segments of the current, of that, the then current ruling class, and in fact bring in a, a, another segment. So there are segments of the, of the political right that are really talking about radical changes. And one of those radical changes, you have segments of right-wing populists that are very theocratic, that wish to bring into the United States a theocracy. Now, uh, the, there is right now, and there has been a movement among a segment of the right to call a federal constitutional convention. How many of you are aware of this? Okay, so for those of you that were not, there's been one constitutional convention in U.S. history, 1787. But there are provisions that if you can achieve a certain number of states, and I always forget the exact number, that a constitutional convention gets called. But no one knows what happens when you reach that number. There's no process for delegate selection. There's no way, if there's a constitutional convention, for the Supreme Court to intervene and say something's unconstitutional. Because obviously, it's a constitutional convention. And the right wing has been, there's an element of the right that's been pushing this for years, in part initially, because what they wanted to do was to have a balanced budget amendment. And they had given up on um, trying to move that through Congress and thought that the only way to successfully move that was through a constitutional convention. But then other elements of the right wing started to think of that as, wow, well, maybe there's other things that we can do, like rule abortions illegal, um, uh, have a flat tax. I mean, we could come out of a, of a constitutional convention with the United Theocratic States of America. And this is not an exaggeration. We're somewhere, by different estimates, between three and six states away from the trigger. Right? Which, is, which should scare each of us to death. Anyone that is interested in democracy, you should be completely petrified of the potential consequences. So the right wing, elements of the right wing that have been moving this, and Fernando mentioned the, um, the, the Koch brothers. So that's one, one response to your point. But in terms of the specific question about why organized labor has been slow, so slow to resist, the fundamental answer, in my opinion, is that um, in, in early 1941, Soviet intelligence went to Stalin and they said, uh, excuse me, sir, but we've got reports of some very strange things happening on the Polish border. And it looks like the Germans are building up their forces. And Stalin says, no, 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 we have a treaty with them. They're not going to do it. And the uh, Soviet intelligence kept coming back to Stalin, saying, mm -mm, something's happening. 
and they're building up forces, and Stalin said, no, no, you're just trying to wreck the treaty that we have with the Germans. And Stalin kept, as a result of the treaty, sending supplies to the Germans that were required by the treaty. He was existing in a certain world where he wanted the facts to conform to what he believed to be the case. And on June 22, 1941, when Operation Barbarossa started, I think it was the largest land offensive in history, Stalin disappeared for a number of days and had no idea what to do and was not responding to telephone calls. No joke, right? Much of our movement's leadership wants things to be a certain way. It grew up with a certain relationship to capital. And it keeps believing that somehow we can regain that relationship, despite all available evidence. And, and this inhibits the, the abiling, abiling, ability and the willingness to introduce change, because change is scary. Uh, in, in, it's, it's easier to do what you've been doing in the past, even if it fails. It's much easier than to introduce new things, because introducing new things carries with it great risk. I'm going to leave it at that point. Yeah, how do you see um, small businesses, uh, mom and pop small businesses, in this equation? Do you want to abolish them? Or do they have a, uh, a place in your, uh, in your economy? I think small businesses remain very important. And small businesses, um, the problem with small businesses is frequently that they get manipulated by big businesses. And it's sort of like the problem uh, when you have tax policy, uh, that why a lot of people don't want to tax the rich, because they believe that someday they too will be rich. And that's no exaggeration. It's like you'll have people that you'll say, well, we're going to introduce this, this tax on the rich. They've got all this money. And people will say, yeah, but someday I may be rich. And what happens with small businesses is that larger businesses manipulate them and say that efforts to constrain big business, if you don't watch out, that's going to affect you in small business. Um, and that becomes a major ideological problem in terms of winning over small business. Uh, small businesses are very vulnerable. Most of them fail, uh, which we don't often like to talk about, but most small businesses fail. Um, but I would say that, at least in my vision, yes, that there remains a role for the foreseeable future for small business. And, uh, but, and there have to be, but there have to be protections for people that work in small businesses. See, this is, one of, this is also part of the problem. When you have small businesses that claim to be, let's say, family run, and their definition of the family ends up being someone that's three generations removed, and may be adopted, right, then really what you're talking about is exploiting that labor power. And we, there have to be protections. There are things that small businesses simply cannot provide because they're small, which is one of the reasons we need a social safety net. And we need to increase the social safety net rather than shrink it because many small, small businesses simply can't afford to provide certain things. And they're going to continue their own sort of race to the bottom in order to sustain themselves. So we have, an, I think, an obligation to try to raise that social safety net to protect people across the board so you don't have a situation of these vast disparities. But a lot of people get crushed, you know, and they come up with good, innovative ideas, and they get undercapitalized or they get crushed. I mean, one, one aspect of small business that I think we have to look at much more are cooperatives. And there, need to be, there needs to be public support for these cooperatives because one of the things that happens is when these uh, cooperatives get started, when they're undercapitalized, they can't sustain themselves. And, and there's also may, often many illusions that are associated with cooperatives. But that is a form of business that we should be entertaining. And it has a different sen set of ethics that can be very, very important. A union can't wait until Operation Barbarossa starts to try to transform. Um, 
it needs to anticipate what the other side is doing and figure out what does that mean for our forces. And if there is one condemnation I have of most of organized labor, it's that. They're waiting for Operation Barbarossa to start. Um, and they're hoping against hope that it's not going to start. So, the, um, so what that means is that we have to transform the way we do our work. And that includes um, real vital internal education programs. It includes real strategic planning. It includes changing the work of staff people. You know, when you have in union staff who have gotten their kudos for the number of arbitrations that they've won, and that's how they've been judged, when you come to them and say, no, that's not the, that's not the priority now, you're challenging their entire worldview. And so you, you need to uh, give people an opportunity to change, give them the tools to change, but then make sure that they change, otherwise you move them on. Um, there needs to be a discussion with the membership. The membership has to understand why things are happening, why there has to be a change in their work. You know, like, I, I was working with a union and I was telling them about the National Maritime Union, uh, which uh, during World War II represented most of the merchant seamen. And I remembered a documentary I saw about them once and about how the union operated on those ships. There were no staff people. None. The union operated on the basis of the members on those ships. And the, they would set up a committee and they would run the union on those ships. If they had grievances, they would handle them on the ships. I mean, they had to worry about German U-boats and they'd still figure out, we're going to have a grievance meeting, we're going to handle things on the ships. We're not going to wait till we get back to New York or Boston to settle the matter. So the idea was that the union was really the membership. The members truly ran the union in a day-to-day -day way. It's a completely different way of thinking. Instead, what's happened over time is that we've gotten into the sense, gotten into the, the, the mode of the staff will take care of things for us. So it, therefore, it shouldn't surprise us when we go to our members and say, well, we have to reduce staff, and now you have to take on more. And people say, well, wait a minute, I'm paying you to represent me, as if they're talking about a law firm. That's the problem. It's an ideological and practical problem. And, and so there's a, a sort of education component that needs to be engaged with the members to do, to look, to understand what we're up against and why we've got to change. And the same is true when you're talking about race or gender, right? That there, there's got to be a discussion. It's not simply imposing on the members, this is the way we're going to do something. It's engaging people in those discussions and then making the necessary changes. Um, my experience is that when people grasp what we're up against, most of them <clears throat> are prepared to make the sacrifices. If they think you're hoodwinking them, they're not. Um, and so this process of union transformation is something that I've worked very hard at over the years. The difficulty is that the interest at the leadership level is very up and down. When there is an appearance of a real crisis. I'll give you an example. It has nothing to do with unions. About 18 years ago, scientists reported that there was a large meteor heading towards Earth and that it would make contact with the planet in October something. They had a specific date of 20, I think 2020 or something. And it's like, excuse, excuse the language, oh shit, right? I mean, let's consult the dinosaurs and what happened when we got hit. And, and then, 
So everyone starts talking about, well, what are we going to do about the meteor? How do we stop it? Then, like a few weeks later, the scientists said, oops, we made a mistake. It's not going to hit. It's going to be close, but it's not going to hit. And then all the discussion about what to do about meteors and asteroids stopped. Well, we live in a solar system that's very dangerous. And there's this thing called the asteroid belt that's out beyond Mars. And every so often, you know, collisions and whoosh, things start coming our way. Um, and things from the Kunaba belt, uh, they start coming our way. So we need to be thinking. But if you want to live in denial, you can say, well, there's no problem. Why worry about it? And that's what we have in the union movement. You know, it's like the asteroid ain't necessarily going to hit. But when we were worried about the Friedrich's decision, all of a sudden they're scurrying around. Then Scalia dies, people stop worrying. Then the Janus case, and now everyone's scurrying around. Instead of understanding fundamentally what we should have known for years, that the right wing seeks to eliminate unions. That's their objective. Um, two, as two examples, Chicago Teachers Union uh, is is probably my favorite example. Um, and I thought, I think that they have a fantastic leadership. Uh, it was the result of a reform movement. Uh, they they uh, took on Rahm Emanuel, and they understood that you had to take them on by winning support in the community. And uh, their support was so powerful that their, their, their president was being talked about as running against Rahm Emanuel for mayor until she became ill. Um, I think that they really are a, a wonderful example. There are other unions and union formations that are doing great things. To your north, the Washington State Labor Council is doing uh, this project, and I'm directly involved in it, on racial justice education. And it's the, the president and secretary treasurer of the council. This would not happen without their active active involvement and support, where they are pounding away about the importance of this for all unions. And I think it's, it's absolutely marvelous. And there, you know, there's resistance. Uh, you know, there are people that are scared. Uh, there's people that say, well, you know, as I said before, the white folks are going to run away screaming. And Jeff Johnson uh, and Lynn Dodson, the president and secretary of treasury, are saying, we're going to keep pushing. Um, and so I think, it's, I think it's, it's tremendous. I think that there are other things that are being done. Um, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 3, in New York, which is a large local, um, they won a collective bargaining agreement to have mandatory diversity trainings for all their foremen. 3,000 people, six hours each. Uh, and it's like, wow, you know? And, and look, as, a, as an educator, I wish it wasn't six hours, but I wish it was six days. But six hours is an is a important beginning, particularly when in most of our settings, we don't do anything that approaches a diversity training until and unless there's a crisis. And then people like me are called on, and we're asked to come in, and we're given generously an hour to resolve the crisis. Uh, and so I think that, that things like that are very important. So there are different things that are going on around the country. It's not enough, though. It's, it's not enough. And, uh, and, and so we've got to be thinking about multiplying these examples, but also tying things together uh, much more, because there's a certain level of paralysis in the labor movement. And with Donald up there in Washington and the right-wing populists running wild, we we can't have paralysis. We have to be fighting back. Um, final point. Um, organized labor remains very split about the environment. And there are many environmentalists who disparage organized labor um, because of the anti-environmental stance that a number of unions take. So the first thing I want to say is that what you have to understand about organized labor, and particularly the building trades, 
and in, in this case woodworkers also, is that when you have unions that exist because they are building or taking something down, then the members are demanding jobs. And they are demanding that their leadership find them jobs. There is, in other words, an institutional pressure that exists within these organizations. It's not that you have a bunch of idiots that are running these locals or, or nationals that don't understand that something really dangerous is happening to the environment, but they're also in very pragmatic terms, and I don't mean that in a good way, weigh, weighing this balance. So they're looking at and, and I hear this all the time. They're looking at the jobs that are promised immediately versus the jobs that environmentalists promise them might happen at some point. And in that sense, it's for many, in many cases an easy decision. Now, the reason I tell you this is that if we're going to win those unions over, you can't go at them as if they're a bunch of idiots. Right? You've got to understand the institutional pressures. So now, given that, um, there, are, uh, there are unions whose leaders um, have resigned themselves in some way that nothing can happen that is envir environmentally beneficial and benefits uh, jobs, the workers. They, have, uh, they justify outrageous stance the pipeline struggles, for example. Um, and we've got to take them on. And taking them on, uh, among other things, means that we have to engage the union movement in real fights around economic development. And fights around economic development challenge a basic approach to trade unionism that's rooted in the thinking of Samuel Gompers, the founder of the American Federation of Labor. Gompers was against labor parties. He was, he was really against labor taking the lead. His idea was essentially that unions should respond to what the employers do. They should defend the workers, but they should respond to employer initiatives. When what we need is a proactive stand by unions in terms of economic development. And that economic development needs to include um, an approach to the environment which is going to save the planet. So we're clashing with a certain ideological frame that exists within the, in, within the union movement. So I think in the situation that you're describing, which is also much like the situation facing coal miners, one of the things that we have to ask is, if jobs are going to be eliminated, what happens to the workers? We have to answer that question. You can't just simply say, shit happens, right? You, you have to answer the question, what happens to people who are 50 years and older? And I, that cutoff is very, very important in terms of uh, people in the job market. What happens to them when there's no more logging? What happens to them when there's no more coal mines? What do they do? We've got to answer that question. And, and, and telling people, we're going to retrain you for what? A McDonald's job? What are we going to retrain you for? When, when that's the answer, when there's no answer about what is going to happen to you, that's when people get very conservative. And they say, better the devil I know than the devil I don't. And yes, if it means that uh, you know, in another generation, I'm going to be uh, waiting in the middle of the Rockies, maybe that's what it has to be, because right now I've got, I need a job. Uh, and, and so that's, that's a challenge, I think, for the environmental movement, the environmental justice movement, those, those of us in the labor movement that see the, the critical nature of dealing with the environmental catastrophe. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that. And I wanna thank you all very much for this afternoon. Thank you.